Welcome to our sixth episode of the DMV Autocross Podcast. I'm Danny Kao. And I'm Atta Tabesh. Thanks for joining us for our sixth attempt at podcasting. This is episode five. So in Star Wars terms, this is The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, autocross <laughs> season strikes back next week with two local autocrosses next Saturday and Sunday. Yes, our autocross season is finally here. During off season, I optimize my Indy Miata with aero, suspension, seats, safety equipment, so I can double duty for autocross and time attack. Hopefully everybody has done winter preparations and ready for the season. So Ada, what's coming up the next two weeks? For the coming week, uh, not much in the area unless you're willing to drive to North Carolina or Kentucky. Uh, for the week of the 23rd and the 24th, however, the season starts for both Mercedes-Benz Club and BMW Club. Mercedes kicks off with their first autocross event on March 23rd at Summit Point, Washington Circuit. The event has been on the waiting list for months and registration is full. Look for fast autocrossers like Marcus Pine, Brian Carwin, Tom Carroll, Matt Hoffman, Greg Pollock, and his boss, Jed Fox, to run close to the top of the timesheet. If it rains, uh, like our long-term forecast predicts, look for Daniel McFarlane and Dustin Grubbs to run at the front. And also, here's a little nugget. Our friend of the week for this episode will be at the event as well. I'm sure he'll be faster than both you and I, Ada. So, Joy. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah, mm, Joy. Not uh, BMW Club has <laughs> the first novice autocross school on March 23rd and test and tune number one on March 24th. Both are at Summit Point uh, Potomac Pad. Registration ends on Tuesday the 19th, and there are still spaces available as of recording. Grab your spot before it's too late. This concludes our local events for the next two weekends. For a few uh, serious business autocrossers, SCCA North New Jersey Region has their first autocross event on the 23rd at MetLife Stadium. And for track addicts, SCCA HPDE and time trials are on Shenandoah circuit for both the 23rd and 24th. All right. So uh, fingers crossed, um, you know, with, uh, with good weather and so forth so well. It's time for our event weather forecast. And let's put our hands together and welcome our resident radiologist who's on location at VIR, Alan Claffey. Mm, he's a meteorologist. <laughs> hey guys, it's Alan with the weather again. It's cold here at VIR where we're doing a live shot. So what happens when it's cold? Shrinkage. Sorry, Danny. <laughs> But it's cold, so again, we have to think of a preparation. So, like yesterday here, it rained all day. People who were prepared and had good tires for it, they probably didn't have too bad a day. The ones who did not, probably did not have a good day. Today, we're not really about really worried about rain. So we have bald tires on because it's still last year's stuff. We have many layers on. Uh, looking ahead at Summit, the long range forecast is going to be cool like in the 50s and there's a pretty good chance of rain so again prepare yourself it wouldn't hurt to have tires with tread as opposed to what we bring here today it wouldn't hurt to have an extra layer on because it's cold other than that get ready to have fun and we will see you on the track for this episode's event highlights and results, we have nothing related to autocross to report. However, some local autocrossers did attend the SCCA time trial at Virginia International Raceway, and Danny was there. Danny? I was there. So, uh, boy, what a weekend. Saturday was a complete washout, and condition was treacherous enough that event officials declared a whole day as practice day. So we're talking about practice. <laughs> we talk <laughs> about practice. We talk about practice. Practice? Yes. <laughs> and then a Sunday brought a beautiful sunshine, but co-wind, but it's not raining, like what Alan kept on saying, right? <laughs> so uh, Brian Carwin finished first in Sport 2, and Sam Strano finished uh, fifth in Sport 2, and Brian Carwin actually took ninth overall. In the autocross HPDE race, Craig Mahefka bests our podcast staff, which include me and Alan, but we came home in one piece, so that was success. Plus, it wasn't raining. All right. So this concludes our event highlights of the week. For our feature of the week segment, we'd like to cover an interesting, informative, or fun topic which could benefit all autocrossers. I've known our guest for over 15 years, and he was fast right away. And over the years, 
He finished close to the top of the SEC Solo National Championship, taught many students at autocross schools, and is one of the most insightful instructors in the area. His YouTube channel, Blacktop Racing, covered many autocross one-take race cars, and his reviews are always spot on. He also specializes in course recognition and often produces course walk videos and always find the fastest line of any course. So here he is, my brother from another mother and father, Shane Shane and Roten. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, welcome. It's so hard to stay formal with Shane because we all know Shane too well from SCCA Autocrosses. Uh, but for the benefit of our DMV Autocross group listeners, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your autocrossing experience, Shane? What's going on, guys? Thanks for inviting me on here, man. I've been watching and kind of itching. I was like, oh, what, when can I get on here? I mean, Brian's got on. I, I want to try to get a segment. So, no, this is awesome. This is awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Danny. And uh, I think you guys are doing a great job. Uh, the road to autocrossing. I mean, I started out in 04. And believe it or not, it was actually Brian Garfield uh, that showed me the ropes. Uh, started off with my WRX, ran 04, 05, took a little hiatus in 6 and 7, came back full force in 8. And that's actually when I started meeting everybody. That's when I, I actually met you both. It was around that time, uh, that 08, 09 mm -hmm. year. 09 being the first time going to Nats. Danny, uh, you had the Evo at the time. Yep. Uh, at that time, because I remember going out there and was like, damn, those guys are local, man. They're fast as hell. <laughs> no, I'm not fast. Uh, Mike Nary was fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it was crazy. And then Atta always bringing the spirit uh, and just the joy uh, to autocross when we get there. And just the STS days, just having a good time. Edwin, uh, along with Justin, is uh, we got a little picture back there oh, of yeah. all of us going at nationals <laughs> this year or the uh, 2023 uh, now. Uh, so, yeah, no, I've been doing it for quite some time. Uh, I would say as far as instructing some of the stories that Danny was saying uh, when he was talking with Brian, I actually wanted to be an instructor a long time ago. I've uh, been pushing and Brian was like, nah, nah, you're not good. No. <laughs> you're not, you're not fast <laughs> enough. I don't know if you know what you're doing. I was like, oh, come on. So I just started volunteering. Danny was an instructor at the time over at what, Lot H? Yeah. And, yeah. And I was just a volunteer. And Brian's like, dude, you're not, you're not getting paid while you're out here. I was like, I'm just here to learn. I want to pick up the craft. I want to get better at the skills. And yeah, I just... I think like I did that for like two years, Danny. Yeah. And learned Why a ton. Why is it two years of volunteering? Yeah. 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 And, and then it, he, he was like, all right, I'm tired of seeing you just always here. So just come on, come on, uh, <laughs> jump on in. So no, it's, it's, it's been great since and I enjoy it. It's one of the things that I just like teaching, you know, telling people, getting people better. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that it makes me better because if you're getting faster, we all getting faster. We're just pushing each other. And everybody that is in the DC area, they always work with each other to get faster. Oh, did you see this line? Did you, did you not see that line? And let's just keep go pushing that way. Oh yeah. I definitely remember, you know, the days that, you know, the first year we'll be looking at, you know, like PAX results of 260 people. Like I was 201st. Right? <laughs> Shane was Just like, Shane was already like in the, like the, you know, like the forties or something. And then it's like, you know, like we just have this little pie chart things or a, a bar chart that kept on going up. Yeah. Those are, those are the fun days, right? Those were, <laughs> when, you, when you're fighting for, for fourth and fifth, you're like, yeah, yeah I, was, I was fighting for 40th, man. man. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thanks, Shane. <laughs> and, well, Ad and I know bits and pieces about autocrossing, and we all know you're the best at what you do, right? There's no thanks. question. Uh, we're going to milk your time for a multiple segment of our podcast, right? So <laughs> there's just going to be a lot of milking. Um, so, and, and I know nobody will be disappointed. So I'd like to steal your brain on, you know, like three different features of the week, okay, if you don't mind. Right. Mm. Um, so um, we want to talk about the, the very first one. We'll be talking about course design and course walk. And the second one would be autocross race car prep and review, which <laughs> you do a fantastic one take uh, autocross car review that we're going to talk about next after that. And also the last thing will be your secrets and instructing students new or advanced. Okay. So these are the three things. So, so, so don't go away. Right. <laughs> you're, you're still, All right. right? No problem. So for these, so for this particular episode, we'll be focusing on your you know, your take on course design and how course walk 
you know, for advanced autocrossers, right? So Ada and I were fire questions that on um, all the things that we can think of. And, and so Ada, you, you go first. All right. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> so Shane, when you see a new course, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting ready for that course walk. What are you looking to do first? Tell us a little bit about your thought process before that walk even begins. So the first thing that should come in is, I actually think of it this way. What are all the things that I've seen before and how can I adapt to this course as, as well as possible? Because uh, a lot of the fast folks don't come out the box super fast. When I'm saying that, it means that they've taken hours and hours of driving and they just kind of log all this in their head. So as I get over to the line, the first thing I'm trying to see is, where can I be on the gas as, as much as possible? And where can I link corners and sections together? Because in the end, it's as fast as you can get from A to B. So anywhere that you're just brushing the brakes too much or you're, you're coasting too much and you're not really uh, getting to the peak of that grip, those are some of the things that are going through my head. So as soon as I get to the line, I'm just trying to plot out, okay, how fast can I take this corner? And more importantly, how well can I exit? So a lot of people look at the entry. You can come in the entry really weird, wonky, or what have you, but I'm always trying to focus on the exit as best as possible because that's going to dictate how I'm getting to the next section and how I'm linking it. So that, that's, that's one of the biggest things that I try to look at. Mm. Wow. So uh, um, that that's a that's a whole load of stuff that Shane just said. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I you know I know some of the advanced autocrossers will will totally get that right. So um, you know what he just said kind of reminds me of um, you know if you if you just continue doing seat time over and over and over and right. hit all these places, then yes. there are only so many things you can do on autocross. <laughs> Right. course right so when you when you see that you go okay i understand the surface i understand i understand the thing i've seen this before and i know i can hit this at 41 42 miles an hour right mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. and then and then he also you know shane you also, you also talk about keep the intensity up and 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 stuff like that so that's a lot of stuff going on i'm like oh. <laughs> i can break it down i can break yeah. it down we're gonna break it one. down we're gonna break it down right <laughs> so here's my next question let's so, say yeah so how do you remember and dissect each element of the course, right? So from my experience, I usually plan how I want to attack each section. Then I stream them together into a single flow course to a point where I have no key cones anymore, right? So that's when I know that I might got it, right? I don't have to remember, oh, I got to worry about here, I got to worry about there. It's just, it just, just, it's just one continuous flow, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so how do you approach your course memorization attacking? So the wild thing is that I actually don't memorize a course. Uh, as much as people think. A lot of it is really just driving by that experience and instinct going through the corners as best as you can. So as uh, in a lot of the classes, they'll tell you, hey, you have to look ahead. And that can keep you kind of weird as far as what the heck does that really mean? And so I started changing the phrases as far as planning ahead, being one step ahead. And it's just like when you're walking down the street, you're not looking with your head down and trying to memorize, oh, did I take this turn correctly or what have you? You're really just thinking about, all right, if I keep my eyes up and plan as I'm going around the corner, your hands and feet are going to be dialed in a lot more confident than if you're just looking at cone to cone to cone. And so that's how I go about it first on the first lap. From there, of course, as you're walking the course, you're keeping in mind, hey, there are these key elements, but you try to kiss it. Keep it super simple. You know, I don't want to start throwing off people saying keep it stupid, but you got to keep it super simple. And as you're going through trying to hit your points, just have a handful of key points of those segments, whether it's a sweeper, uh, transitions, typically you can just drive through those. But a lot of it is really going to be, hey, how did I exit out of that set of transitions over to the next set? And once you kind of nail those um, as far as in your head, how you want to take those corners and link things together, that, that's, that's really how I, how I try to attack it. So do you review your strategy with other autocrossers before you run, during your run? Um, I know a lot of fast autocrossers are... are bouncing ideas off of each other. <clears throat> Tell us how to double check your work. 
So double checking your work is uh, great. Great advice is really just whether it's a co-driver, uh, normally it's the person next to you. For myself, it was all the above, including going over and talking to the fast guys. I remember starting off with Ian Baker, Sam Strano. You know, mm -hmm. you got the squirrel and the goat around mm -hmm. here uh, and those two. And they had totally different driving styles. So what I would end up doing in my early years was actually sitting in with them. A lot of the fast drivers will let you sit in on either lap one or lap two. And this way you can just kind of get your data in early, right? Okay, you're not winning. It's fine. But you're trying to learn as much as possible. And by getting in the seat, you get not only what people are saying, but you also get to feel, experience, see it. And that's a big thing that people are like, oh, I don't want to get in a car. No, I, I always recommend for folks to drive with somebody uh, that is fast because you'll get to see and be like, okay, the car can take the turn at this speed. And then you'll get back in your car and say, all right, let me try and duplicate that as best as, uh, as possible because I know I have the gear uh, to do it. I just have to trust the car. And you'll be surprised as far as going in. And uh, that's the way I, I approach a lot a lot of the, the walks is taking in that information and then uh, talking like to folks in the STR grid at the time, like Carwin, uh, hey, I tried this. Did you try this? Uh, not really sure, but I did do this. All right, I'm going to try it. And, uh, and let me know. And if you're open to your competitors, knowing that you're just trying to make each other faster, a lot of them are very uh, communicative on that front. That's a fantastic piece of advice, but also that Carwin impersonation was. Yeah. I want to no. see. I want to eat something healthy. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Wow, you went there. You went to the healthy food. I don't. I mean, I've had Long John Silver's with it. So I don't know that healthy. You know, with the sauce. With the sauce. Got to get the, the sauce. sauce. I'll tell you. I, I'll pick up. I, I pick up my uh, MCS from you know from my ND at his shop. Yeah. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I, bought, I bought some chicken, you know, for lunch. For him, yeah. Right. So, so on the way out, I was like, "Oh man, I just feel old." That he says, "Yeah, if you would have ordered the white meat that I ordered instead of eating oh. the dark meat and mashed potato, oh. you would have feel so much better." And I was like, "All right, oh. see you, Brian." So, yeah, just, <laughs> I don't know if I should cut that out. No, if you would have gotten a salad instead, I know, man, it felt a lot better. Yeah. Like, give me oh, not cut yeah. that out. Give me, man. give me grain rice instead of fried rice. I said, "No." <laughs> Rice. What you, come on, man. Just I think it's called it. brown rice. Brown rice. Brown rice. You got to keep it healthy. You got to keep it healthy. Oh, <laughs> light and good. That's right. Good. But but I would say um, I want to name sort of three. You know, after what Shane was saying, I want to name three yeah. people that I used to ride with. I rode with Sam Strano. I rode with Lee Picone. And I oh, and, nice. and interesting. I rode with John Lugod. Nice. You know, back in nationals, those three guys. You know, when I get into the car and close my eyes. I can't tell who's who. Really? Wow. Yeah, because they all they all sort of accelerate and mid corner and exit in a completely different style. Their car moves differently. It's all more like, uh, huh, 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 you know, like it's very definitive. Like boom, 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 boom. Right? All, Where, all of them? All, all, three? all just three of them. Oh wow! They, they, okay. they, you know, like you said, the car was like, hey man, I think I felt like this before. Oh, that was in Sam Strano's car. Wow. Right, yeah, or that yeah. was in Lee Picone's car, and they were all different cars too. So because mm -hmm. they know what they want the car to do. Yeah, they they drive mm -hmm. in a distinctively different style than than you know, like if I ride with Carwin or or you know, like you know anybody else, they they just don't feel like that. Even though they could be just as fast, but but the feeling is different, which is weird. Oh no, right? absolutely, I, yeah. I concur with that because like Sam, I could watch his videos, but I could not duplicate his. Car I can control. either. Mm -hmm. Like his car control is like crazy. Like the 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 person that just had me in awe all the time when I sat in his car is daddy -O. daddy -O does the most abrupt stuff in the world but his car control left foot braking is like how the heck did you get out of that sir yeah. and you're and I'm peeking over and like looking at his feet I'm like oh he's left foot braking he is he just gets on the gas he's like wow wow just moving the car around and that guy is like yeah I can't I can't watch you um yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I can't duplicate those things. Yeah. I mean, I, like, don't, 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 don't copy the greats. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
<laughs> copy the normal guys. <laughs> yeah, they found they found their niche and they perfected that niche. Hence why they're multiple multiple champs. Yeah. I mean, all of them right there that you just named. Uh, and if you add in Daddyo, what they all got at least five. What, yeah, Strata a lot. Is like fifteen. No, they're like ten or something. Or something's like yeah, like thirty. 30 bro, I'm just trying 30. to get one right now, yeah. man. Come on, <laughs> man. Come on, just give me one. Yeah, you yeah one. share. <laughs> just share a little bit. Just give me yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. No, they're no, they're stingy too. That's how you be a fast autocrosser, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, Shane. So, if you see a course that that you just absolutely don't like, like like eh, right. So, how do you deal with it for the rest of the day? Cause I, I've, I've seen people that they see a course and they just like, oh man, this thing blows, I, I, you know, and then they automatically just stop having fun. Right. But, but, but you can't do that. You got there the whole day and you can still win stuff. So, so how do you approach it when you see something that that's not exactly to your liking? I mean, that happens uh, quite a bit lately, especially with the focus on speed. And the thing is, is that you can always work on little things. So you just kind of fit, um, pick that one thing and try to hone your craft on it. So for, for example, you go to a, a tight lot, right? Or, or lots, we're not getting them big anymore. So what are you trying to focus on? Okay, those tight pivots, car setup maybe. Uh, how can I look ahead and lead or swing the car around a little bit more? And then that actually adds that, that challenge, as you may, okay? And then uh, from there, if it's more so looking at speed where a lot of the courses they're trying to maximize the the average as you may and not have as much old school all across uh feels then from there you're working on another set of skills okay how late of breaking can i get in on this corner how can i balance the car to maximize that speed and that cornering grip without getting too greedy so there's a few things that you can actually do just kind of pick uh, a handful of spots where it will bring that challenge to you and that that's that's basically what what i suggest to a lot of people is pick something work on it and try to get better because a lot of those times you get more runs too uh, is there anything you want to let our listeners know outside of our grilling questions about the course walk? <laughs> Any secret tips uh, that we should know? Uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying. Uh, the community is great in all the crossing. So definitely don't shy away from co-driving or just sitting in the car with folks that you know that are top. Uh, a lot of the top folks, you can just look at the pack sheet for uh a reference like the top 20 top 30 folks uh that that particular percentage you can just jump in the car with them you know or don't just jump in and start grabbing e-brakes or anything like that but <laughs> don't do that. somebody hit that happened to me before <laughs> but but as far as just making uh trying to see what you can learn from them and most of us are talkers i mean we get out we enjoy what we're doing uh and we want to talk about it more so that's one of the biggest things that i would say uh the, the next thing is really just go out and try to have fun yeah, it's competitive or it can be. Hey, uh, there's a lot of minutia trying to fight for a top class. Don't get caught up in all that when you're getting started. Uh, just try and focus on having fun and honing one to two particular skills uh, as you as you go out uh, per event. And that's 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 what I did my first few years. It was like, okay, practice being smooth on the on the brakes, transition off, work on your trail braking. Just pick one one or two things and just. Uh, play around with that throughout the day. Great. All right. So thank you, Shane. But you're not no off the problem. hook yet. <laughs> ah. All right. For everybody, we'll continue with Shane in our next few episodes. Oh, yeah. Here, we got to show it with the short, <laughs> do <have> the short <laughs> shirts. <laughs> All right. We'll continue with Shane in our next few episodes and discuss two other topics race car preparation and review and Shane's secret on autocross instruction. So don't go away. We'll start at the next episode or the next segment. All right. Okay. See you guys later. Thanks, Jen. It's time to meet a new autocross friend. Our guest today reminds me of the international man of mystery. And by that, I don't mean that he's like Austin Powers. He's well-traveled and then used to drive an uncompetitive 996 <laughs> and sit some crazy times at Porsche and BMW autocrosses. 
multiple people would tell me this guy Dean is fast and at this race and that. And I'm like, who's Dean? Right. Mm -hmm. So here he is to tell us about all about all about himself, our mystery autocross friend Dean Mohi. Yeah, hey guys. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Um, could you tell us a, a little bit about how you got started autocrossing? I, I felt like you just showed up one day and started kicking butt. Where, where, what's going on? Where's that speed from? Yeah, I mean, autocross is is. Um, I kind of did the opposite. I think like most people did. Most people, they're like, I want to do car stuff. I don't want to spend a lot of money. They start autocrossing and they're like, oh, I'm going to go do track stuff. I kind of started the opposite of it. Um, and I, I did track stuff at first. Like I was like car obsessed, like everybody else, right. That's probably watching this. I did track stuff and I like, eventually I got kind of bored bopping around, kind of going round and round Shenandoah, round and round Jefferson, the same old tracks, like over and over again. Um, so I, I, I felt like I wasn't like learning anything, you know, you, you try and I'm one of those people that wants to send it and it's kind of hard to do that with an instructor in the passenger seat. Right. And there's walls and Shenandoah is scary. And so they always tell you like to, to kind of like settle it down. And so at a certain point I kind of got bored of it um, and stopped doing stuff for a season. And then I did an autocross kind of on a whim and I figured like the thing to do in autocross is to like, there's not a whole lot that can go wrong. So you might as well freaking send it. And that's, that's why I went and to, to try and freaking send it, right? And learn yes, how to drive a car yes. when it's sliding around the whole time and that sort of thing. So, like, I feel like I had a bunch of seat time already. And then I went to autocross not afraid of, like, like when you've been around Big Band at, like, 80 or 90 and you're looking at a slalom or a sweeper, you can go, well, I can just attack this because I know what it's like to go around Big Band really fast. So let me just, like, you can kind of be, like, fearless in a dumb way like not that there's nope. lots of scare but like nope, you know nope. you don't want to hit cones sometimes you make yourself scared you don't want to hit all these cones when i first showed up i was like i don't care about hitting cones i just want to slide the car around and so i just started attacking um uh. and and trying to be on the limit all the time and i think like a lot of people when they start autocross you don't have any idea what the car can do right you're just like even the hardest you've ever braked on the street is like not half as hard as you'll ever break at autocross or like in a slalom like you have to recalibrate your brain of what a car will do in a slalom. And I, I, I remember the first autocross I ever did was CDC and at some random lot way north of DC. I don't think anyone runs there anymore. It was like a baseball stadium lot um, north on. Um, Is that 270? Yeah, off 270. Uh, Frederick. Frederick. Yeah, yeah Frederick. Yeah, Frederick. And it yeah, was like Frederick figure East. eights and it was so confusing. Yeah, I had no idea yeah. what was going on. Yeah, I was like my right. first runs, I was off course like most of them. And then I rode with Marcus Pine. I think it was like his first or second. It was like early season for him. And I, CDC was like super cool about letting you just jump in with anybody. And yep. so I was like totally new guy here. I was like, hey, can, you, can I ride with you? And it happened to be Marcus Pine. And that recalibrated my brain like entirely. Like he had a huge slide and he after he caught it, he was like pumping his fist, yelling like, yes. <laughs> and the car was like. Oh my god, this is auto like what have I been doing track days all these years for? So like that was um I don't know, it it, it just kind of gets under your skin. Like it's exciting, you're sliding around, you you every run you can see who you're beating, who you're not beating, right? Versus like 2014 track days, like there were no like track timers, right? You had like a V-box right. or nothing. So you were yeah. kind of going around and around and you didn't really know how fast you were going, if you were improving. Yeah. You couldn't even compete with yourself. So like autocross was like it felt like adrenaline and uh competition yes. and all this sort of stuff that's like keeps you there um so i think the question was like how did i get up to speed quick i, I kind of rambled, yeah, no, that you answered it yeah. perfectly I well i mean i mean you, you, you started it, you 110 know? miles an hour <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you know uh, well I, I started at 30 miles an hour so i mean uh, yeah <laughs> no no, like no we kind of get it no we kind of get it no. yeah I feel like I'm wearing the Dean shirt. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's I'm like overdriving is time. fun, right? I, I still <laughs> love to overdrive to this day. It's the best. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I started exactly opposite. I went, I went, I did autocross and then kind of slowly crawled into, uh, you know, tried to call into track stuff. So, so I guess, no, what you're doing actually makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think you get more out of track when you like you doing both, I think is, is good for everybody that likes to do car stuff because yeah. now when I go back and do track stuff, 
man, like I'm so much more confident. Like you autocross builds that muscle memory of like sliding the car around, like car understeers, you know, take a little out, take some chops at it or the rear starts to go. You just counter steer. It's like hardwired into your brain because you do it like a hundred times every run. Right. Whereas on a track day, you have like two big oversteer events the whole weekend when you're first starting and you're like, oh, my God, you know, so you don't you can't really learn. So now you you can take that autocross confidence to tracks. I feel like I don't know. Everyone I talk to, I like tell them do both. Don't just do one because they they all help each other. Yeah. Yeah. We got to, by the way, we're going to cut this part off because uh, yeah. all, all the all the regular instructors say you're already yelled at enough autocrossers. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> so, yeah, sh- no, no. <laughs> I'm just oh kidding. God. I'm going to leave it in. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, 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 I like autocrossers as students. I mean, that's that's actually my preference because because we can talk the same language and, 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 and basically say, hey, man, you're doing this or you're doing that. Don't do that here. And, and then, you know, then, then they understand. You know, yeah. They just kind of yeah. automatically control themselves and make sure that they don't get both of us killed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you're, you're responsible for your instructor, right? That's the thing. Dude, That's right. You That's right. Limit yourself. Yeah. 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 So, so our next question is this. So, uh, your uh, 996 uh, mm-hmm. was actually my first Porsche. Awesome. Right? Well, I didn't know that. I, yeah. I so everything i have <laughs> you know back in 1999 to actually bought a new one. Oh wow holy smokes yeah that yeah. that that was that i don't know why That's i did awesome. that yeah. yeah i mean it was an awesome a very nice car it but but for some reason it's not known to be the fastest autocross cars other than a gt3 i've, I've seen i've seen guys in, in in ohio driving 996 gt3s are blazing fast but not too many 996s out there right uh, yeah not, hardly any yeah 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 so tell us how you managed to go that fast. I mean, now we know a little bit of a track thing, but it's still a very hard car to kind of go fast at autocrosses, right? And, yeah. and then what prompts you to go out and later on get into an M2 and then now to the uh, to the to 981 Cayman? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I like I had like things I wanted to be able to do, right? Doing track days, I wanted to learn to like drive fast, and I wanted something in my mind was like I always wanted car control, and I feel like I wasn't getting the track, like I said, and so autocross was a way to get car control. Kind of right along with that was like I I was driving a Mazda Speed Miata at the time, which was super fun, but it's like really forgiving and doesn't have a lot of like flaws or things to drive around. Right. So I was like, well, why don't I I wanted to experience something that was like totally the opposite. And that's like the engine way out back. Like what's what's the 911 thing? It's like it's (laughs) it's so common. Everyone says, oh, the 911 is so great, blah, blah, blah. Like what's I didn't get it. Right. I wanted to see like what's the deal. Right. Um and so I thought buying the 996 would be like, well, first of all, it's the only one I could afford it because it was like 22 grand at the time. And I'd moved to D.C. Yes. and it was so expensive. And oh, my, my wife was going to go to to grad school and, and all this stuff. And uh, I was like, well, I better get if I'm going to get a 911, it has to be the cheapest one. And I want to learn how to drive a rear engine car. I want to understand why people put them on a pedestal and and just like see what there is to be learned. Right. And this totally opposite experience. So. It was really difficult, like you said. Like it's not like an ideal autocross car necessarily, and it honestly took me a long time to bond with it because, like, you drive it like the Miata, it's just understeers. And I, yeah. I get in and try and like hurl it around a slalom or a sweeper or whatever, and it just it kind of plows. And I think like, does this car suck or do I suck? And like the answer is I sucked, right? Like I had to <laughs> learn to like listen to what the car was doing, and I think that was like really important. Like that understeer was. I wasn't trail braking nearly enough, right? You got to kind of manhandle the car and put weight on the nose, get the rear rotating. Like it likes to have you be a little bit forceful with it and and cause like be super conscious of weight transfer. And this is something that the Miata would just did anything you wanted that you didn't, I didn't have to be that conscious of it. I didn't realize how much I didn't know about weight transfer and having that stock 996 on the base suspension that was like 13 years old and with base sways, right? Not even the sport suspension, Mm -hmm. like it would lean all over the place. I think the shocks were like totally shot. And so I had to, like, it forces you to learn. It slaps you on the wrist, right? And says, you're not doing this right. Don't try and realign the car and fix the understeer and dial it out dial it out with your feet and hands. And so it was like a huge learning experience for me. Um, And so I think like learning about weight transfer, being thrown in the deep end, learning how to drive the car 
I, I could kind of, I started to know enough to know that there was a really good car under there. It just had that old suspension. So I was like, well, my plan to buy a GT3 is like totally shot. I was going to buy the 996. Like, <laughs> full disclosure, I bought the 996 with yeah. a two year plan. I was going to, this was 2014 or 15, 2015 maybe. Oh, okay. 996 GT3s, I've been watching them for years. Depreciation, they right, right. down, right? But then like, right, oh, after, but right, right, back, years, right after that, it went back up. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I bought the 996. Yeah, that's right. Hold on to it. And then in two years, the GT3s will be here, and then I'll just pop over. GT3s went through the roof, and I'm stuck with the 996 and thinking, okay, let me make it as close to a GT3 as I can in some ways, right? So I, I went and found, like, Olin's Road and Track. Um, I think that's, like, the thing the car needed was it just needed more, like, damping and control. It kind of really flopped around. Uh, yeah. And the, even the sports suspension, like, I think back then Porsche didn't think Americans were, like, hardcore enthusiasts like the sport suspension didn't lower the car the mo 3 or whatever it is it was like a jacked up ride height and then there was rest of the world that the sport suspension lowered the car everywhere but america so i think they had this like weird idea of what we wanted and so i was like okay i'm gonna make this more like maybe it, it would have been if the car was built today and so i put the olin's road and track in it which really the car has coilovers to begin with it's just it's just uh almost gt3 stiff springs and it's mm -hmm. shocks um but they were the cheap olins right so single adjustable knob but then yeah. um you know the car was it was like a little sharper right i still had the base sways i didn't go crazy and modify the rest of the suspension or have like um um like lower control arms and, and all the other stuff from people put in from the GT3 just had yeah. that. And yeah, the car camber. Was mm -hmm. So yeah, didn't, I always got like 1.4 degrees camber, but the car was yep. so good with this like really civilized suspension. It was like the perfect one car for autocross and all these other things or for autocross. And as a daily driver in the car, we would like drive to Canada, pack full of the dogs yep. and all our stuff. Um, and so I, I don't know, just it responds so good with that open diff in the back. It'll just rotate on entry and it, and it teaches you how to drive it if you listen. So I think like rambling answer again, I, I don't know how I managed to go quick in that car other than just try to listen to it. You know what I mean? And then modify it a bit and cheat, right? The old yeah. lens is cheating a little bit and fast tires are cheating, but like just trying to, it's a good tool to teach you how to drive, I think. And I think that's, that's right. what I tried to and do is listen. You, how'd you jump to the M2 though? M2, uh, yeah, I got. That's my, that's my question. See, is how did you end up in there? I thought I was going to keep that car forever, right? The 996. Mm -hmm. And when I sold it, it had 112,000 miles on it. And I was at the point where I was like, I started doing more autocross with SECA and seeing more people and seeing really fast people. And people were talking about nationals and doing national tour events. And that sounded awesome. I really wanted to try and do that. But the 996 was like buried. Like with the Olins that I put on it, that put me in ASP. I think before that it was even in ASP because I had um, 200 cell um catalytic converters because one of my cats started yeah. rattling and rather than spend 2200 aside on cats i just bought aftermarket sport, yep. uh, sport cats sense. they sound sound nice right so yep. it was like an upgrade and not just maintenance so i was buried at asp and i'm not going to drive a hundred and thirteen thousand mile 996 to lincoln and back i don't have room for a trailer so i needed like this a car that could be competitive not in a crazy class yep. i could throw stuff in throw me in and yep. tires drive all over and that the m2 was it right it was b street fits four tires no problem Got cruise it, control yeah. decent stereo so that was that was it It was sort of an unemotional uh choice and i was hoping to love it but I, it kind yeah. of was always like a tool but you were flying it yeah it it was it was fun it it was more like the miata it, it, it's a weird car like the 996 entry oversteer all day trail break it, it, it the thing wants to turn and then you just hit the gas and dig out but the m2 like doesn't you have to really force it to turn it doesn't want to turn yeah, it's like so it. stable yeah and then you get on the gas and it it looks dramatic and it slides and all this stuff yeah but that's and that is fun but it's kind of like a one trick pony for it right like yeah like it wants to slide around like a hoon and it mm -hmm. slaloms really well because it's super stable um but other than that like i didn't i missed like all the I missed attacking on entry, right? And not pushing. So you went back to port. Yeah, moved back to port. That was the answer. Yeah, huh? that was the answer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. Oh, man. Are you happy with it? I, I, I knew within the first 200 yards that I was going to love that car. Oh. <laughs> like, oh. like, I bought it from Eric Core and I, t I went to his house and test drove it. 
I'd never driven one on the street. I'd driven one like PCA autocross before. I knew I really liked it, but I'd never driven on the street. And before we got to the stop sign, I could already tell like the gear shifter felt so good. The stuff coming oh, through the okay. steering, the little noises from right behind your head that the engine was making. I was like, crap, I'm buying this car, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good, it's a great choice. I mean, it's, that's not a, not a mistake. Yeah. It's <laughs> such right. a good car. The color yeah. my wife doesn't like, I, li I like the color. It's the yeah. most outgoing color I've ever had, but my wife thinks I'm going to wrap it still. Uh, hopefully she can't oh, hear me. Oh, oh, she oh, thinks oh, I'm going to oh. wrap it white, but at this point, I don't know. I no, we can wrap stay it in yellow. Yeah. You should wrap it lime green. Yeah. <laughs> or the blue. I showed her the blue of, of yeah. your cars because I've always liked that color and she was she yeah. gave me a glare. So yeah. It's a beautiful color. No, I thought she, no, I don't think blue could blue, you know, the my yeah, then, then there'll be three Mike Tavners. I know, right? I on. know. Yeah. <laughs> I like the yellow. I like the yellow. Yeah. I'm biased. I, I'm, I like it on I like it on your car. Yeah. I, I'm yeah, yeah I, I like it a lot. I've I've watched this car for years admiring it, so it'd feel weird to wrap it, you know. Nice. Yeah. yeah. No, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. yep. So you're one of the few local autocrossers mm -hmm. who race with all the clubs. Mm -hmm. Tell us which club you started with autocrossing and then um, the other clubs that you race with throughout the area. Yeah. And, and, and if there's anything that like stands out to you in overall experience mm -hmm. or preference or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, we see you everywhere. So I know. I try and do everything I possibly can. Yeah. Um, nice. It, so I started with PCA Potomac actually doing autocross with them oh. because it was it was I, I just bought a 996, right? My first ever autocross was CDC, but the way timing and everything worked out, I didn't do anything with them for a while after that. But I did PCA Potomac quite a lot. I think I did the last ever autocross that was at RFK Stadium, like in the parking lot. Wow. That was like my second autocross, I think, with them. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed it. It was a great group of people. It was um, nobody was looking down at the, the fried egg lights. Everybody was super cool about it. And, and honestly, like, <laughs> I, egg lights. the, the right. SCCA group was really intimidating. Cause I, I, I signed up for one, I think a morning only. And I went and there were like 250 people at FedEx field. And there were people like trailering cars in and swapping wheels in the parking lot. And I was like, Oh my God, this, it felt like going to nationals <laughs> for the first time or something. Right. Compared <laughs> to like Adam. Bowie. Yeah. And that was you, that was you guys. That's yeah. That's Ada. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was like on that huge lot. I couldn't even remember the course you know i i was like mm -hmm. halfway through like i was doing 35 40 second runs in bowie and there you can see the whole course from one spot there it was like 65 seconds and these huge sweepers and the next cone is like 100 yards down and i was i was like oh my god i need to get better before i can come out here and like run with these guys so i actually kind of shied away for years so but but now i mean i'll run with every group right and it's it's a yeah. bit of a shame fedex is lost um you know it, it's hard to pick favorites because Every group has run a little bit differently and have their their like pluses and minuses and lots that are better and 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 um, yeah. So I don't know. Um, I think the thing that does stand out though is like going is like the old FedEx days. Like it's such a marvel of like organizational like discipline to have seeing two hundred and fifty cars come through that lot in two separate autocrosses during one day, right? Two techs, one, one at lunch, one in the morning, uh, two drivers meetings, two everything. And it's still, you were, even the people that started in the afternoon, they got tech were leaving at like three 30, right? Like it was such a tight run ship. It's like mind blowing, like organizational stuff like that is still stands out, um, to this day. It's like incredibly impressive. It's like better run than some national events. Like, Truly, yeah, it was wild. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, like you know, like people my age or when I started, uh, you know, that that's how we got started. So we got completely spoiled. Yeah, it's you know, it, it's in, crazy. In those environment. Yeah, it hasn't yeah. been anything the same. I mean, I've been, I, you know, I've been to other regions and other different places and did autocross, and there's not, there's nothing like the heydays of auto uh, FedEx. Nothing like that. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah nothing. So. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. That's for sure. But most of the clubs, I think, do a great job. And there have been a lot more people. Like, when I, I oh, think for sure. 10 years ago, it was much more, I just do my club. And I was going around doing everything. But now I feel like there's a whole, a lot more people that will be at BMC and SCCA and all these other ones. Oh, yeah. And even come from, like, Pennsylvania to come down here and do it, like, Skelly sure. and, and those guys. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it feels like it's in a pretty good place right now, yeah, even though we've lost the big lot, you know. Yeah, the it is. yeah, but there's yeah. so many choices now. It's in a way, it's almost better. Yeah, because you have a choice every single week. Every week, yeah, right? like every it's week, fantastic. Yeah, wait lists for all kinds of stuff. Right? It's 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 <laughs> yep. nuts.
<laughs> yeah, I always kind of ventured out to different clubs and stuff like that, but primarily I'd be doing SEC stuff, especially the days I was, you know, doing national stuff. But but it, I think started in 2018. I've been I've been going through a lot of uh, mostly auto, you know local stuff. I I started skipping national and and started going to auto, local autocross stuff. So you know what? After you know six or seven or eight different clubs uh, that that I go all the time, we we all the same. Yeah, yeah, they all operate pretty much the same. The caliber of courses are very similar now. Mm-hmm. The organizations, you know, everybody's getting great. So yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely definitely a good time that that you can go anywhere now in 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 the DMV area, and then it'll be a fun fun time. Yeah, for sure. yeah, I agree yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So uh, my next question is: so as one of the fastest drivers in the area. Can you share some of your speed, speed secrets? I mean, come on, just not not just like bombs away and send it. I mean, one well, 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 more stuff, okay, Dean? I mean, you can cough Max it up, right? Attack. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's right. So, if you want that half a second, what, what do you do to get that half a second? Which so picture David Marcus, right? Is, if is I knew, sitting right there, he, he's like three, two seconds ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what do wow. I do? Okay. Yeah. What do you do? What that's do you do? Why, uh, <laughs> you're wondering why I sold the M2? And yeah, yeah. Um, man. I, I thought about this because it's like, I've tried to get advice like this from people over the years. And it's like, you try all kinds of different things to try and see what works and not, there's kind of two answers. And I hate to have like two answers instead of one, but like for most days, right. You're going to look for that last half second on your last run, right? You've taken a few already. You're what's probably happening right now is you're probably not concentrating as much. You're probably a little excited. You've been watching times. You've been talking to your friends between runs. You're probably losing concentration a little bit. So like for final runs, when you really need to try and pull a gap on somebody or catch someone who just passed you, the thing that that I've been doing is make sure I go back and do the thing I do between my first and second runs, which is actually like sit there and visualize the run, like actually get your brain in a place so you can concentrate because so much happens during the days. You get so excited. You're full of adrenaline like the constant it's such a after a certain point when you stop learning the basics it's a mental sport which i think is what keeps us all coming back right it's like about discipline and being being focused so close your eyes try and walk your way in real time through the whole course over again and you'll know if you can't do it like you get to the second corner and you like get distracted you got to start over that's what happens to me all the time sometimes it's so freaking hard to get to like the second or third corner and that's how i know that i've actually lost my focus even though i feel ready for the next run i'm not so that trying to walk through trying to move your head like you would be on the course and move your hands like you're going through the corners i think that's for me and this is copying other people that have told me to do this. It's a good way to like refocus you, get you back in and allow you to be precise and hit all your points and do everything right on the course, right? Because that's probably all you really need to go that half second faster is, is be disciplined and hit all your, your points. And there's no magic to it other than just being like your head in the zone. But the other thing that it's a little bit like the maximum attack thing, right? Go out and send it. You know, some days you get out there and you like your first run, oh, you're pretty good. Then your second run, it's like the same freaking time. Third run, same freaking time. Like you do the same run over and over and you're stuck. Mm-hmm. It's not those days where you know how to go faster and you just need to do it. You, those days where you, 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 you can't for the life of you figure out how to go faster and you just feel stuck. Something I try to do is like drive my last run like I hit a cone, right? Like I just convince myself that I hit a cone right off the front start or actually yeah. hit a cone. Because you know what happens when you hit a cone and it's your last yeah. run. Yeah. You're a little bit mad, right? And you, you hit the brake. Yep. You're just a little more aggressive. You're going to try this. You think about things differently. You're less in your head, and you're more just trying stuff. And you're being a little more aggressive, but not just throwing things away. And that sometimes that's a good way to just kind of break out of same run uh, itis that I that I get some days. I don't know. Those those are my my two things. Trying. Drive like you hit a cone. Send it, dude. That's really great. <laughs> Going back to send it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it. All right. So what's your racing plan this year? Um, where can our listeners find you at this year's races? Uh, and are there any goals that you want to accomplish um, this season? Man, so sadly, I don't really have, like, goals this year. I mean, I the doing the run and doing national stuff was really fun and i want to do some more and i bought the m2 specifically for that did i freeze mm-hmm. no okay no, cool i see my yeah. face here frozen doing a kissy face it's very distracting 
no, 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 it's fine. Um, yeah, so I had this like very strict goal. And, like I want to go do as many national tours. I want to do nationals. Yeah. So, and so for the last few years, it's been like very focused on that. And I think like I've learned a lot with the M2 in that driving style, but I kind of forgot a lot of the things the 996 taught me because you couldn't really do them in the M2. So I kind of want to just get back to those basics and enjoy the car. Yeah. And then also like do a better job of like talking to people because I get to events like, I, I don't know if it seems like it, but I'm kind of like an introvert and I kind of feel like I need an in to start a conversation with someone. It's really hard to just walk up and talk to people. So I want to try and and do that more this year. I think that's like a really important thing for me for lack of like driving goals, right? Like I want to actually do that. So if anyone sees this and uh, thinks I'm like ignoring them or being a jerk or I'm like whatever, no, it's just because like I get my own world or I'm like too embarrassed to come talk. So like say hi i don't know <laughs> no that's perfectly normal because i, I mean I'll, I'll tell you I, for for quite a few years I, I would tell i would catch myself and say hey what happened to me right because i i'm generally the person that i like to talk to everybody but sometimes when the competition is there you you, you try to get into that focus and then all of a sudden yeah. i feel like i'm just ignoring all my friends yeah. You know? yeah and then i really feel bad so so nowadays i i really make a point like i feel like i'm a little bit more mature now so what i just try to focus during my runs like every other time I would spend as much, as much time, you know, hanging out with folks because it's ultimately to me, I'm, I'm no, I already passed the, you know, the, the stage of winning is that important. So what I would do is, is I, I, I definitely get the fun of hanging out with friends. That becomes a more important thing, but you're too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a little bit of both. I want to do both. So you're going to be an asshole. No problem. <laughs> hey, now that I don't have a competitive car, if anyone wants a, uh, uh, offer me a co-drive needs a, a tire warmer for national events. I'm, I'm available. Yeah. <laughs> put that out there. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Leveraging this platform. Yeah. That's I right. Love it. That's I love right. It. That's right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dean, for joining us, man. Um, you can find Dean at the races this year in his beautiful yellow 981, 981. Cayman. Cayman S. Yeah. Uh, make sure to say hi to him. Walk up to him and say hello <laughs> to Dean, okay? <laughs> but do not switch his numbers around, all right? He's already fast enough. Let's not give him any more reruns. And thank you, Dean. Hey, thank you, guys. Uh, by the way, thank Dean's you. number is 48, okay? 48. 48. 48. Yeah, don't, you guys better watch around. your numbers, all right? I'm, I'm coming for you. No, I have stickers. <laughs> am I, am we I got stick vinyls, brother. Yeah, we, we can't take our numbers off. High five. All right. Thank you so much, Dean. All right. Yes, thank right. you, Dean. Bye, you guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Awesome. See you soon. Yeah, thanks. Thank you to our new Autocrass friend, Dean. This concludes this podcast episode. Everybody's excuse, except the novices, our novice meeting begins now. And this week's novice meeting is driver's meeting. All right. So for driver's meeting, Ada, um, you know, yeah. it's it's almost like this meeting. <laughs> it's a yeah. it's kind of an information dissemination type of thing from the organizers, right? Yes. So exactly. so as a novice, um, what can you expect in a driver's meeting? Because I know that as a as a person that goes there all the time, um, yeah. it has a tendency of being kind of repetitive and sure, of course, and, and so on. But it's very important for the novice to listen because I because yes. I actually think that majority of the drivers' meetings are for novices. I agree. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. the The point of the drivers' meeting is 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 twofold. I think one is for novices, so they see what's going on. It's organized, and this is going to be the flow. But I also think uh, part of the novice, or not novice, the driver's meeting, excuse me, is also for the seasoned veterans because they might have uh, a change. They might say, hey, we're going to flip a few run groups around. They might say, hey, we're going to do it this way. We're going to do it that way. We might have, they might even tell you the number of the runs might have changed, right? So if for some reason inclement weather and there's a few people, they might say, hey, we're going to have more runs. I don't know, right? Like this is some of the stuff they go over. Um, and then I, I've been through different uh, driver's meetings where they even talk about like the novice stuff during the driver's meeting, not just afterwards at the novice meeting. Um, so so it really it, it is a time to pay attention, especially for novices, because you'll learn a lot. You'll pick up a lot and then you'll be more comfortable. And And as you know, being comfortable is kind of the one of the keys to success, right? Yeah. So I would say, you know, when when you go to a driver's meeting, um, the first thing uh, obviously is the greetings from every, from the um, the organizers. Sometimes they will part. introduce everyone, 
right? And then, uh, then after that, they they should surely they should go into um, some of the more uh, sort of the details, and then usually follows up of oh, this is a great course built by so and so, and then and then that that's probably a good time for the organizers kind of give you an idea on what they're thinking about the course, and so it's probably worthwhile to kind of remember um, or listen to, and then after that. Like what Ada said, you know, uh, the I think to me the most important information that that on this is is they're usually at the time they determine how many runs that you're yeah. getting, right? Yeah. Um, and then and some groups even they they don't even tell you the run order at at autocross. So that's the time they tell you, okay, here right. um, if you're in this class, you're that class. This is where you run, right? Um, I think most of the DMV uh, autocross clubs don't do that anymore they, they let you know that in advance yep. but but some of them will make changes because you know you figure if one of the he's had like 50 cars and the other he has like 20 cars right yeah right. so they they might make some of these adjustments right um and then um then one of the things that you know for better or worse um there's there's always some groups that would that, that they're going to come back and try to teach you how to how to work the course again <laughs> right but if you hit it for 20 yep. years it's a little hard but 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 for novices, yes, it's important to know. You know, if you have a cone there, if it's outside of a box, that's two yep. seconds. You call in and tell them that. And then if the cone is down, obviously that's two seconds. The pointer cone doesn't count. If the if the car goes around the pointer cone and it's off course, you know, these are the things that that a lot of these drivers' meetings will repeat and tell you exactly what that is, right? Um, but I would say that the most important thing there is is you know you want to listen and understand all that, but. But always find somebody that knows, uh, or a, a seasoned person that's been doing autocross as well, and just follow them. Uh, yeah, and you know, I was thinking about it too just now, and I remember <clears throat> I had done my first bunch of autocrosses with SCCA, so I was ready to run out to my work assignment on the fly as soon as I finished my last run and rotate in and out, and um, and I wasn't paying that much attention to this other org that I ran with for their first time, and I was still a fairly new autocrosser. And I remember running out to my work assignment to the station I was supposed to go to. And people looked at me like I was crazy. Five or six cars ran, seven cars ran. And then everyone stopped and walked in. And I was like, what's going on? Like, wh <laughs> where's everyone going? Like, and it's those little things that are different sometimes, right? Yep. Are you changing on the fly? Are you not? They go over those things at the driver's meeting. And you won't look like I did. Yeah, definitely pay attention because sometimes, <laughs> you know, some groups will do a driver's meeting and then they'll do a course walk. Oh, there you go. Yeah, right. right? Exactly. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, it just, it just, it's just different. So, so, and again, the most important thing at a driver's meeting is, is, you know, pay attention to what they're saying. Um, you know, when the driver's meeting start, be there promptly, right? Mm -hmm. make, make sure that you don't want to be the last one there because some people, some organization won't start until everybody's there. So, sure. so, so yeah. you got everybody staring at you and say, well, what are you doing? Right. Um, don't, don't be that guy. Right. Um, <laughs> and me. yeah, don't be at a, <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> no. be me. and then, nope. and then, uh, and of course, after that, after a driver's meeting, they usually break it down into the groups. Some groups are what you want you to pre-grid for, mm -hmm. uh, for he number one. Right. So they usually tell you that during registration or a tech inspection. So, so if you run he number one, you need to get your car parked. But a lot of some other groups was will have the drivers pulled up to the grade immediately after, um, you know, after a drivers meeting. So, so that's the time that if that happens, um, I, I, as an older guy, I usually run to the bathroom. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think age has anything to do with that's it. Right. You run to the so bathroom. so you run to the bathroom before you before you grid your car and you go to work. But um, but usually why a, most of the group will immediately follow the drivers meeting unless there's a course walk. Um, you report to work, and then you actually go to the, your work assignment, and then and then that's and then that's that's usually what concludes the drivers' meeting is just either people go to the, you know, either go they either take a break because they don't run, or they go to work, or you know, it starts driving by going to the grid. You know what else I'm thinking about while while talking to you right now is there's always a warning. There's always someone that says driver's meeting in five minutes, driver's meeting in 10 minutes. And I think if there's one thing to take away from this novice uh, meeting right now, it's to attend that driver's meeting and, and pay attention. I do think it's it's if there's one thing to take away, it's go to the driver's meeting, pay attention for five minutes. It's yeah. that it's that simple. Yeah. And I think you're going to gain you gain from that. Right. It's not for their benefit. It's for yours. It's for ours. Yeah. 
And then again, the more you know, the more you understand, and the more you're aware of what's going on, the easier the fun day, exactly. the better day is going to be. So, exactly. so spend that time, you know, uh, listen up. Um, you know, don't, 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 don't listen to uh, other people yapping and all that stuff. You know, they don't talk to, you know, when they do that, it, it's, it's a little rude. Sometimes it could yeah. be me or Ada. No, no, no. I was going to say, if there's one thing that you and I actually know, it's how to listen during a yes. driver's meeting. We, some would say that that would be our expertise. Yes. You know, yeah. you know, yeah. I, when it comes to driver's meetings, the first two people I think of is you and me. Really? So. Yeah. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I thought I would just make up crap as I go along. <laughs> no, I one time I stole the mic from Avanti during a driver's meeting. I and remember I just that. Talking. Oh, it was so bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, bad. Uh, so Adam does have a tendency to take over driver's meetings to the clubs that he's familiar. So, or, or not familiar. Yeah. I've tried to walk up there and steal a mic before from people I don't know, and they just didn't give it to me. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you know, eventually, eventually taking over all the mics. <laughs> I just want to, I just want to talk into the mic. Leave that's right. That's right. But we do yeah. enough of that here. So maybe we, we shouldn't be doing yeah. that over there. So now it's out of my system. I'll never do it again. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> all right. So we're going to make this thing nice and short, right? So, uh, and again, well, thank you for joining us for this driver's meeting or novice meeting oh, yeah. in our next episode, we'll talk about the do's and don'ts on working the course. Which is important. I mean, uh, work is just as important. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's not. But but please join us to find out more. All right. Okay. Alrighty. And that wraps up our sixth episode of the DMV Autocross podcast. Thanks for spending the last hour with us. We again hope you find it informative and fun. Yep. And don't forget to join us for the next episode. Until then, keep those tires on the track and that wing in the back. That wing in the back. <laughs> hey, oh, by the way, Alan. <laughs> Uh huh. A radiologist. He's he's a meteorologist, but okay. <laughs> has the biggest wing possible. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Oh, oh, biggest oh, wing possible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But the oh, smallest man. gurney flap. Oh, gurney flap. Oh, got it. Oh man, that's so good. All right. You know, this novice meeting is turning into like my favorite part. Like I I don't know why. I'm starting to love it. Yeah. Like it's it's like I don't know. I don't know. I well, ne well, next know. novice meeting at the end, we'll add uh, Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul, and then see who's going to win. Oh, they're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll talk about it in the next episode. All right, All right. see you, Danny. See ya. Bye. Bye.